Thank you for tuning in to Together We're Ready, Massachusetts Prepared, a special program to encourage residents, families, and communities to make plans and prepare for severe weather, natural disasters, or other emergency events. Joining me in our studio are Cheryl Bartlett, Commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, Susan Wolf Fordham from the University of Massachusetts Medical School, Amanda Stone, the public health nurse in the town of Mattapoisett, Dr. Sarita Chung from the Emergency Department at Boston Children's Hospital, and Dr. Alfred DeMaria, the medical director and state epidemiologist for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Thank you all for joining me. Commissioner Barton, let's start the conversation off with you. Oftentimes in emergency situations, many of us just think in terms of police and firefighters responding to an unforeseen emergency event like floods or tornadoes. Uh, we may see on the news uh, from um, other parts of the country, even locally in Massachusetts, we're subject to severe weather like blizzards, hurricanes, and floods. How does public health fit into emergency preparedness? Well, from a public health perspective, it's important that we ensure individuals, families, and communities be prepared for emergencies, natural disasters, and um, including things like loss of power, evacuation from your home, maybe even being stranded in your home. And so to be prepared at home, it's important for households to have kits that include drinking water, non-perishable foods, flashlights, batteries, radios that are battery powered so that they can get information. But often what we don't think about is some of the medical needs when we're in an emergency and to be planned for that in terms of having enough medications, medical supplies. And so really it's important for us from a community perspective that we think about all of the health needs of our community, think about those that are infirmed and disabled. So not only once we're prepared for our family, thinking about checking on our neighbors, elderly, those that are infirmed and disabled, uh, again, in the household. How should people stay informed either before, during, or after an emergency event? So really important to have up-to-date information mm -hmm. as you're planning for your family's needs and your community's needs. So reliable news media sources, local and state officials are often giving bulletins. So we also have a 211 helpline that people can call and really get specific information for the particular area that they are in. And again, a battery-powered radio so that you can stay in touch with news. What about those times when there's actually no cell service? What can you do, for instance, with the Boston Marathon? Cell service went out a lot of difficult times in trying to get a hold of loved ones. Really important to have all forms of communication. During that particular um, cell phone shutdown, there was texting that was available. So I think if cell phone is not available, to think about email, texting, and again, maybe having somebody out of your region or state in your family that would check up on you and make sure that they can make a connection and find out what your needs are. So one thing my husband and I do is we have index cards in our wallets with key phone numbers. And that way, if our phone isn't working and we can't retrieve the number, we don't have to remember it. And the other thing that we do is we've made a simple spreadsheet for um, our daughter listing her doctors her medicines, the doses, and how we give the medicine to her. Sarita, maybe you could add a little bit more. As a pediatrician, what would you recommend for families in terms of being prepared? Well, I think as the commissioner said nicely, you really do want to think about um, all the different ages of uh, your children and your family and what needs they have. I think especially for your young children, your infants and toddlers, you want to think about having supplies such as if they are formula-fed formula or toddler food because you won't expect to find those in shelters. You also want to uh, make sure you're prepared and bring diapers, um, supplies such as those because they, they won't be also found in shelters. And then um, being in a shelter or evacuating is very scary for a child. So you want to make sure that you reassure that child, but maybe have toys or things that they're comfortable with, their, their loveys, so that they feel secure in, in, in a very different environment. I agree. You have to have those loveys right next to you, <laughs> otherwise it can be quite scary. Yeah, sometimes adults need their loveys too. <laughs> That's <but>. true too. <laughs> so let's learn, I guess, a little bit more about what we can do with our own families and neighbors with Get Ready, Individual and Family Preparedness. We are the Stone family, and we are going to show you our emergency plan. plan and this is my plan to get out the, the front door, and this, and this is my plan to get out the back door. These are my plans. Because I am here, um, a, I guess, a single mother, and 
I needed to feel that if there was an emergency that I would be prepared to be able to take care of my two children. I think the kit that Carrie has for her family is excellent. It's going to put her in a better situation. And there's a lot of general things that all kids should have, but people should realize that they have to identify their particular needs or anything that's going to make their stay in a shelter or help them deal with, it, with the emergency at hand. This is the first aid kit. A blanket, goggles, duct tape, extra batteries, radio, plastic so you can cover something up, a rain poncho, extra food. Expandable water jug, glow sticks, toiletries, a charger. I think everybody should do a self-assessment or a risk analysis for their family to find out where their strengths and weaknesses and where their needs are going to be, especially in, a, in an emergency or a disaster. Together we're ready. Massachusetts prepared. Public health is a key component of emergency preparedness. Every day, public health works to make communities safer and to help individuals improve their health. In emergencies, public health is very important in responding to the emergency and providing services during an emergency, but then also working in their community to help people recover from an emergency and to get back to the place they were before an emergency happened. Welcome back. Now, Amanda, in thinking about large-scale emergency events, I imagine there's an outpouring of volunteers you know, who are really willing to help. Massachusetts has a history of very strong community support and volunteerism. In fact, in times of emergencies, people's initial response is to want to help. And they will reach out and help their neighbors and their community, oftentimes putting themselves at increased risk in order to do so. Now, I imagine recruiting, organizing, uh, all these volunteers require a significant amount of coordination and resources. It certainly does. Uh, following 9-11, uh, the Medical Reserve Corps was established and that provided a framework a local um, f to enable local communities to be able to better manage their local resources in terms of volunteers and through that system people can be pre-registered, pre-credentialed, be trained and deployed and also Mass Response is an online registration system for the state of Massachusetts. It's administered by the Department of Public Health. Uh, Mass Response integrates local, regional, and statewide volunteer um, organizations and resources and assists with the pre credentialing and registration and training and deployment of volunteers. I'd just like to emphasize sure. the importance of pre-registering to be a volunteer so that we know who the volunteers are because in a disaster when many people show up and very generously donate their time and their skills to help, if we don't know who they are it's really hard for us to manage that pre-registration pre-credentialing really critical. Or do you have to have, you know, be a registered nurse or have any kind of medical background? Uh, we need medical and non-medical volunteers from all disciplines and all walks of life. There are many needs and roles to be filled in times of an emergency and so there are jobs for everybody. What would they actually be doing? You know, if they're not necessarily needed for medical, what would someone be doing, filling what, what type of role? Well, for example, if a shelter has to be opened, we need greeters, so we need people to help with paperwork. There's always paperwork involved. Uh, if an emergency dispensing site has to be opened, there are, there's information that has to be provided to people coming to the site. Um, there may be children that have needs or somebody could watch a certain group of people in one area or guide them to another area. So I recently signed up for mass response. First of all, it was very easy to do and um, you could list some interest areas and so mm -hmm. I will be working on administrative issues, legal issues, because I'm a lawyer and also I have disability expertise. What kind of training is involved in order to get you know, everyone ready? The training is really based on the, the needs of the community or the organization. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone interested in volunteering could contact their local emergency preparedness coordinator to find out what kind of volunteer uh, opportunities are available and what kind of training or other requirements may go along with that. Thank you. 
Let's take a look at how one Medical Reserve Corps works with the Greater River Valley MRC, which is based in Andover. When a uh, disaster happens, it, it really is part of our human nature to want to get involved and to, to volunteer and help each other, and that's the basis of the Medical Reserve Corps. So it was put together in, in a context that we could train people ahead of time. This way we have all our volunteers in place. We know what to do with them, what capabilities they have, what background they have, so that when they can go into these situations, they know what to do. The time commitment is whatever I can make it. And if I'm available to help, I come and help. It's been coming to get some training, you know, being able to come to help out when, when it's needed. Right now, I'm, I'm having a great time doing flu clinics. The actual hands-on work involves probably about three hours a day and uh, about three days a month. The rewards of what you do are far greater than the effort you're going to put into it. I urge people to sign up for the Medical Reserve Corps because it's a great feeling at the end of what you do for minimal effort in doing it. I've done some of the flu clinics, I've attended some trainings, the psychological first aid training, um, the training for animals that are in need of shelter when disasters happen. So I thought it would be a really good way to give back to the community, to meet new people, to do a little bit of networking, to help people in need, and it's been a lot of fun. It's a good sense of giving back. Whatever talents you have, it, it, it's not all about being medical. It could be anything, but it's giving back to the community, and we do have a lot of fun. Mass Response is a centralized database of local and state volunteer programs. It includes the local Medical Reserve Corps programs, the Disaster Behavioral Health Responders, and the Animal Response Team, the SMART Team. Mass Response will benefit local communities um, like Amherst and a volunteer from Amherst because it gives volunteers a central place for them to register for their different volunteer programs, and it also allows them to connect to other volunteer programs in the state. Volunteers always have a choice when they want to respond. Just because they sign up doesn't mean they have to go to every event that happens. To volunteer, please visit maresponse.org. Welcome back. Everyone has unique needs and abilities, so planning needs to be individualized. Susan, what about people with functional and access needs? So I think that cities and towns and our public health regions need to plan for functional and access needs, and that can mean a number of different things. There are some people who may have communication needs. That would include people who may be blind and may read Braille, or people who are deaf and communicate via sign language, or people with cognitive disabilities who may understand simplified language. It may also mean people without disabilities, like people who have limited English speaking ability. There are other kinds of access and functional needs, for example, people who may need help taking medication or um, performing medical, small medical procedures. Um, there are people who need help with activities of daily living, like bathing or eating. There are people who need service animals or use assistive technology to help them stay independent. So Susan, what should someone with a functional or access need do in order to plan for an event like this? I think they should do what I call what if thinking and planning. So for example, what if I use a power wheelchair and there's a power outage and I'm not able to power up my battery? What am I going to do? What's my plan for mobility? What if I don't understand English very well and I don't think I'm going to be able to understand my town's warnings or alerts? Do I have a neighbor or a friend who can help me? What's my communication plan? How should people with functional or access needs um, stay informed? So I think the first question you need to ask is how is my city or town going to let me know about alerts and warnings? Are they going to put information out on a website via Facebook, Twitter, is there reverse 911, for example, which is what my town uses? Mm -hmm. And if someone um, is deaf and uh, would like to receive reverse 911, they could ask their town if there is TTY or relay capability or perhaps texting ability, which might benefit people who are deaf or who need to see a visual information instead of hearing it auditorily through the 
phone. I think Susan said it very nicely. We have many individuals who have many uh, complex medical needs that now live in our communities. And so they may have oxygen at home, they may re rely on equipment to help them um, do their activities of daily living. So it's really looking at all those individuals and finding out what do they need or what will happen, what resources they will have if their power goes out. So if they use uh, battery assisted or um, a ventilator, if their power goes out, do they have a battery or a generator to help them to, uh, sustain the medical needs that they have? And so that's really a discussion that um, they can have with their medical health care teams to figure out what, what they would need. Also, medications are very important to, and to understand that um, you know, would recommend that you have an extra supply of your medications and in case you need to evacuate to bring that medications with you. So what else can folks do to be better prepared? I think for those who have medical needs is to really um, look at your community and see what, what happens. If there's a power outage in your community, you may want to inform you know, the local uh, police or fire or ambulance services to find out um, if there are any sort resources that can be helped, but also to help them realize that you're a priority as far as when the power comes back. Your, your house needs to be the house that has power going to it because, because of med medical necessity. If you don't have, if you rely on public transportation, you want to f um, try to figure out other ways where you can get transportation through friends or families or through your community. Um, and then I think what's really important is that children, children represent 30% of our population and they have very different needs compared to adults. So depending on their developmental level, as you can imagine as a baby or a toddler, babies will not move away from danger, toddlers may run towards danger. So it's really trying to um, make sure, as Susan said, that they're well cared for, that there is, is experienced child care providers that are able to take care of these children. Sheltering children can be very challenging, but also thinking and about disaster if it happened during the day children are not with their parents like I have three children and I'm not with them right now and reunification is a big issue like parents if there's a disaster right now parents um, will do will not follow any directions until they're reunified with their families so really thinking about how the community helps reunite the families together is very important Ensuring the whole community is ready for an emergency or disaster goes beyond individual preparedness. Now we'd like to tell you about the Boston Health Resilience Network, a partnership between the Boston Public Health Commission and Boston community leaders and organizations to protect, promote, and preserve the health and well-being of the city of Boston. When I think about preparedness, I think it's an everyday effort. For me, one of the biggest things is uh, community. How many people know their neighbors? How many people know their neighbors by name, first and last? We want to start a conversation with our friends and family and our neighbors and get the conversation about what? What do you think? The idea around resilience kind of at the general level is about the ability of a community to bounce back quickly after any type of major incident. The most successful communities that have recovered from disasters um, have been all about that social connectedness and so making sure that people are actually plugged in and that people know their neighbors and they know what each other's needs are and they're able to support each other. But the Boston Health Resilience Network is one of those um, opportunities where the idea of really being participatory in the actual response and recovery process. Partners have committed resources. They say we have this level of expertise that we want to bring to the table. We have these resources such as space, such as specific types of equipment that we're willing to offer. I was sitting in my office, I got a phone call, uh, turn on the news, look what's happening uh, downtown of the Marathon. And so we received a call from the Boston Public Health Commission asking for assistance. They said we have a need. Everybody wants to help. There's that challenge on how to organize everybody to contribute to their best ability, uh, that's what the network is going to do. So we were contacted by the American Red Cross Family Assistance Center and that allowed us to provide space uh, and resources for families, for first responders, uh, for some counseling, for trauma counseling. It really brought together a, a rather diverse set of resources from both the state, the local and, and uh, federal level uh, to meet the needs of this very disparate group. Uh, that um, was significantly impacted uh, by this, by the, the trauma of the Boston Marathon. Could you, in, um, in that moment, pick up a bag and it have all the things that you need in it? Could we do that? Because we're playing uh, emergency preparedness bingo, and whoever is the winner of this game 
or take this bag home. If you haven't started your uh, goal kit, this will be your new beginning, right? A photo ID, your clothes, passports. <laughs> How about food? Batteries. How about a toothbrush? First aid kit, flashlights. Bingo, I'm prepared. <laughs> We spoke early on and throughout about health and healthy communities, and our volunteers in Andover detailed their efforts around flu preparedness. How does the flu fit into overall community emergency preparedness? Now we'll make a visit to the Edward M. Kennedy Community Health Center in Worcester to see how they're gearing up for the flu season. There's two reasons why it's really important to get the flu vaccine. One is to protect yourself from the flu because you can be pretty sick from it, but second is really to to protect those who are vulnerable. And so by everybody being immunized, it protects all of us from any kind of outbreak or epidemic of the flu. The flu is a virus, influenza virus, and there are many different strains of it. And each year our um, Center for Disease Control tries to develop a flu vaccine that will protect and give you immunity from that virus. Le puede dar el flu. Yo creo que muchas personas piensen que um, la vacuna um, puede dar el flu, pero no. The only way to truly know if you have the flu is to have a test. So most often we just treat clinically based on symptoms, but ideally preventing the flu is better than trying to treat the symptom. If you are in contact with a family member that has a flu, I think good hand washing techniques, not touching people will prevent the spread of the disease. So that is one way of reducing it. Um, you know, in, in the healthcare setting, we when people come in, if they have a cough, we'll make patients wear masks. Staff who are sick, we will have them not come in to work if we think that they might have the flu because we don't want to expose other people to it. We want to protect everybody from the flu, so by all of us individually taking responsibility and getting the flu vaccine, that is going to protect you as well as protecting other people. To learn more about the flu, visit mass.gov slash flu. Dr. DeMaria, please tell us, why should we be concerned about the flu? Well, influenza is, uh, the first thing is it's very unpredictable. You can be prepared for the flu, and there's a lot of things you can do to um, protect yourself and your family from influenza. Among those are the kinds of things we talk about, you know, cover your cough in your sleeve, not in your hand, because you're going to be touching things, to wash your hands, to make sure you keep the house clean, the high touch surfaces. You want to reduce the risk of coming in contact with the virus. And the best thing you can do up front is to get a flu shot, to, to get the influenza vaccine, because that can protect you uh, from the flu, but it can also protect you from bringing the flu home. It can protect the children from exposure to family members with the flu. So it's important for everyone to get the flu. And the common recommendation is for everybody six months of age or older mm -hmm. to get a flu shot every year. Does the flu shot actually give you the flu? No, the flu shot cannot give you the flu. In fact, there was even a clinical trial that demonstrated that. So I think, you know, people feel, you know, they have some symptoms after they get a flu shot. Sometimes that can happen, uh, but uh, it's much more important to be protected against the flu as best you can be protected. So how do we recognize some of the symptoms of the flu? Well, influenza is not just like an ordinary cold. An ordinary cold, you feel, you wake up one morning, you maybe feel like you're coming down with something, you're not quite sure until maybe the end of the day or even the next day. Influenza hits like a ton of bricks. It often is associated with a high fever. A muscle aches are prominent, which you don't usually get with a cold. And that cough and the sore throat comes on right away. So that, that's influenza, and that's why it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous disease because it can lead to complications, especially in people who have underlying conditions that put them at risk of these complications. It can lead to pneumonia, it can lead to uh, respiratory failure in people who have underlying lung disease. It can even lead to a heart attack in people who have underlying heart disease. So it's very important to do everything possible to prevent What should someone do if they actually do have the flu? Well, stay home. That's the first thing, so you're not spreading influenza in the community. Uh, and uh, wh while you're at home, to uh, do the kinds of things that we recommend in terms of limiting the symptoms in a way that uh, will be effective in, in helping get through this illness uh, and remembering to get, still get a flu shot the next year. 
So when it comes to the flu, who are the highest risks? I know you said six months or older, but who, I guess, are the, the highest risks? Well, the, the highest risk for the complications are people with underlying medical conditions that put them at risk, like heart disease, like lung disease, mm -hmm. neuro, neuro, neurological diseases put people at risk. It's very important for people to keep their hands away from their eyes, their nose, and their mouth, especially during flu season. Should people be using that antibacterial soap or maybe an antiseptic soap? Or you don't need an antibacterial soap, mm -hmm. but uh, the alcohol rubs and gels do have their use because the influenza virus is relatively susceptible to that. So if you can't wash your hands with soap and water, you can use these alcohol rubs and gels. If you're sick, please stay home. And that's actually also for the kids. If your kid is sick, please pull them out of school and um, let them stay home and recover before going back to school because we know that schools are kind of a vector of spreading all kinds of illnesses. How long does a flu last? A few days? A week? Well, you can feel sick for up to a week or more, but uh, the infectiousness usually drops off after five days. And we now say 24 hours without a fever, especially in a child, uh, is good to go for, for school or other activities, but you still want to be careful. If something even more severe than influenza comes along someday, everybody is already practiced in terms of dealing with it. So if someone does have the flu, should they seek medical attention? Well, the flu is never pleasant, but for some people it can be dangerous, so they need to be aware that they have this condition. First of all, they need to be very much aware of getting a flu shot and, and to communicate with their health care provider. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean they have to be seen, doesn't necessarily mean they have to go to the emergency department or, or do anything like that, but they really need to, need to be aware, and the family needs to be aware of the signs, like short, increasing shortness of breath, chest pain, uh, recurrent fever after the fever goes away. There's a variety of things that people should be aware of if they have a family member. And the most important thing they should be aware of if they have a family member is that they get a flu shot themselves so they're not bringing that virus home to that family member. And the other, you know, you can get, get a flu shot almost anywhere now. You can get a flu shot in your doctor's office, you can get a flu shot in clinics, you can get a flu shot in the pharmacy, you can get a flu shot in the supermarket, you can get a flu shot in your town's flu clinic. Uh, and that's another, another place that people should be thinking about is how to get connected. Perfect. Now, Commissioner Bartlett, tell us from the healthcare provider perspective, should they be getting a flu shot as well? Well, we are really trying to get 100% of healthcare providers, particularly in hospitals, to be vaccinated, and so we actually keep track of that. And we're really moving towards 100% uh, uh, compliance. I think Sarita has told me that her hospital is 100% compliant with providers having flu shots. So, And that is the goal. That is the goal. Many aspects of emergency preparedness begin with our health and well-being. That's why we've come together for this important discussion to remind everyone to be informed, plan ahead, and be prepared. And more information, of course, is available at mass.gov slash dph slash ready. Thank you for watching. Together we're ready, and we hope you are.